Awesome, cool. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so yeah, we have the second part two of inclusive user research. Um, this time we're focusing on diversity. Last time in our December event, we focused on accessibility. So we're really happy we could pull off this event and just do more justice to this wider topic of inclusion. By diversity, we mean uh, ethnicities and race and geographies. Uh, so yeah, it's really important to look at the other side of inclusion as well. Uh, we do want to thank all our sponsors and supporters. So thank you, Zebra people. I'm going to go through some slides just to um, thank them properly. And also thank you, UXP again, to support us uh, with making this Zoom event possible. And uh, we have Rick, who will be tweeting from our research thing account. Uh, so if you want to be retweeted, use our hashtag, which is inclusive research. Um, moving on. So Zebra people, if you don't know them already, they are a specialist uh, user research uh, recruitment company as well. So you can reach out to them just for a casual chat. Uh, they're really friendly people. You can try and find out more about the market or you can ask them about their perm and contract research roles out. I have seen Ben posting a lot of roles on LinkedIn recently. So I think he would love to hear from you guys. Uh, so yeah. Uh, they they sponsor our meetup uh, because meetup is a fee and it makes it possible for us to basically keep this event free for all of you. So it's really great to have your support. Thanks, Ben and team. And then also we have UXP UK who give us their Zoom access. So we're able to reach a much more wider audience. And, you know, we've been able to do events during this whole pandemic, which is great. And uh, on that note, I wanted to do a shout out to the next event, which looks really interesting. So if you haven't attended a UXPA UK event or you don't know that there is an event coming up, uh, watch this space. I think there should be a link to the event being tweeted as we speak. It's called uh, Together, the Essential Fusion of Culture and Design. It looks really interesting. And it's on March 25th, which I believe is next week. Um, before I kind of go into the detail, um, I just wanted to also give a few shout outs. So Rick will be tweeting and we also have uh, Michaela Lewis who will be sketchnoting. So watch Twitter because she usually shares a work in progress version of her sketch notes. Um, I also wanted to tell you that, you know, I wanted to go through a little bit about this event and why we're doing this. and. It was a journey to pull this event off. It wasn't easy to find speakers. It's really hard because I don't think a lot of us talk about this. Um, and I think I have figured out why. I feel like as a community, we haven't probably realized the importance of this mm -hmm. and what better space than the research thing to start talking about uh, why inclusion is important and not just inclusion in terms of accessibility but also in terms of you know including different representative samples like ethnicities and stuff. I attended this uh, event or conference recently uh, it was at Advancing Research it was just last week and I attended this talk by Megan Campos uh, I put her Twitter handle at the bottom and uh, it really reinforced this theme because she did a really amazing talk about uh, the risk of deprioritizing demographics or this kind of thing in research. And what she did was really interesting. She ran a survey uh, with researchers to understand how many of us are actually doing this and uh, what trade-offs you're making and things like that. And what we learned, which is no surprise, is that demographics criteria is generally considered less important than project specific criteria. And that might explain why we struggle to get people to talk about this because maybe we're thinking there are only certain types of projects or maybe we're thinking, well, we just need to be quick and lean and you know we don't have time for demographics. Um, another thing that was really interesting in her survey, she broke down the demographics into different factors that basically comprise within demographics. And interestingly, race, 
ethnicity, gender, and sex were considered to be less important than other factors like um, socioeconomic stuff or your profession or your location or your age. Age, interestingly, was the most important thing. And it might be that people are thinking those factors that are important are the more visible factors, whereas race, ethnicity, gender, sex are probably more invisible in terms of how they contribute to behavior. So people may not think that demographics shape behavior, but by assuming this, we're basically giving in to structural and social inequality. I mean, even when I, I have done this myself, even when we put screeners out there, if we just say mix of genders or mix of male and female, what does that mean? Are we including binary? non-binary? Uh, are we only considering cisgendered people? Like, so there is lots to think about when we think of demographics. So it's a really interesting topic. And I think, I don't know how much of us have spoken about this topic before, um, but it's about time we start talking about it. We may not get it perfect, but as an industry, rather than as an individual, we can start shaping the best practice around this. And that's why I'm really excited that we can do this talk today. And I'm really excited about our speakers as well that we have today. So we have Celine. Uh, she's from Design It London. And she's going to be talking first about how to make your research more inclusive. She's probably going to expand more on some of the things I mentioned. She's going to be doing a bit of a reflection from her agency life and just helping us understand when we need to make this happen. And then we have Rachel from Pearson, and she'll be talking, she'll be taking a bit more of a macro lens and talking about how to bridge cross cultural boundaries. And, you know, how do we design for cultures that are not our own, which is a really interesting take as well. I'm going to let them go one at a time. We will have time for questions after each talk. Uh, Anya will be uh, monitoring the questions. Um, Anya, did you want to mention anything before we move on? Yeah, please please use the Q&A uh, section for the questions because then it's easier for me to see what have we already answered and what do we still need to answer. So I'll look into the chat, but please, 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 for my sake, Q&A would be great. Yeah, and for general engagement, you are welcome to use chat, but otherwise Q&A. I think that was everything from me. So over to you, Celine. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Oh, actually, was there anything else? Oh, yeah, we would love to hear <laughs> what you thought of the event. So do tweet and come back to us and tell us in the end what you thought of it. I will stop sharing now. Just let me know when you can see my slides. Cool. Not yet. No? I can't see it yet. Can anyone else see, Anya? Not yet. No. Do you want to try again? Yeah. For everyone else to know, we just tested this. So. I think it's loading now. Yeah, we can see. I think there was a setting. Um, there we go. Great. So just glad those are, are coming up. But I, first of all, just really want to thank the, the research thing team for having put this together. So it, it's quite a few people are involved. So Shweta, Anya, Rick, and, and Ben and Chris as well. And you kind of see all the work that goes into putting something like tonight, tonight's event together. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping, as people were kind of already mentioning in the chat, that this is really just the beginning of a conversation that we're going to continue to have. Um, I think you know, this topic of inclusive research is incredibly important. And as researchers, we have really just the, the biggest role to play in it. When the research thing made their call for speakers and asked, you know, when is it important for researchers to include participants from different ethnicities and geographies in research? The first thing that came to my mind is, when is it ever not? And yet their question is exactly the question that many of us get asked by colleagues and clients and increasingly so. Many of us no doubt find those conversations daunting and it's hard to not walk away thinking, 
you know, did I really handle that the best way I could have? Now, inclusive research is a huge topic, which covers far more than what we're discussing tonight. And it's really exciting that the research they have made this a focus of their talk. So starting back in December with the panel on accessibility. And if anyone hasn't seen that already, I, I really recommend you go check it out. So tonight's topics of ethnicity and geography are both in their own way incredibly complex. And there's a lot of invaluable resources out there which cover them far better than I can in 20 minutes. So I'll share a list of some of the designers and organizations working in this space at the end of my talk. So you can kind of go and explore a bit more in your own time. So tonight, what I'm gonna focus on is where ethnicity and geography have played a role in the projects that I've worked on. Some of the challenges I faced myself or seen other researchers face on a day-to-day -day basis when trying to bring those diverse perspectives in, as well as some of the practical steps and tools that I've started using to make sure this is something that we're doing in our work. I think it's really important to start off by acknowledging that as a white, able-bodied, middle-class and educated researcher, I'm sharing my experience from a position of privilege and I'm in no way leading this conversation. I also really need to acknowledge the many people I've worked with in different agencies across the years. So my old colleagues from Revealing Reality, as well as my research team at Design It Now, who've continuously pushed me and challenged me to be a better researcher. I also really wanna invite all of you tonight to challenge me to point out where I could do better. And I hope there's some time afterwards to not only discuss questions, but also for people to possibly share their own experiences of dealing with this topic. Some of what I cover today might already be familiar to some of you and new to others. What I really hope is that everyone will be able to walk away either having learned something or at least be able to consider a different approach to add to their toolkit. But before I dive into the topic, let me just tell you a bit about myself. So I'm a researcher at Design at London, a strategic design studio. And no doubt, like many of you in the audience, I didn't set out to be a design researcher straight after school. In fact, I, I didn't really know this profession existed. So when I graduated in 2015 with a history degree from the University of Warwick, my plan was to go do a master's and you know, really hopefully follow in the footsteps of some of my favorite professors. My area of focus was migration and mental health. Immigration history is a growing field that's more and more exploring that sense of you know, has human movement actually been a norm for human existence more than an exception? And my area of focus, particularly for my thesis, was, was the racialization of mental health disorders and how racist systems may explain the higher rates of diagnosis of schizophrenia, particularly within certain migrant populations such as Western Indian men in the UK. I was drawn to that topic due to its strong link to identity and difference. I'm a first generation American with Belgian parents and I grew up moving around when I was young. When I came to the UK for university, what was very clear to me was that my experience of migration was incredibly privileged. In fact, I wasn't really deemed a migrant at all, rather than labeled an expat. And so ethnicity and geography affect all of us, but they affect us differently. Now, back then I felt like my research wasn't really taking or you know, advancing any conversation beyond the classroom. But in our jobs, we get to work on projects that directly affect our users, our teams and our clients every day. So I want to share some of the projects um, where ethnicity and geography have really, you know, had an important role and, and kind of changed our thinking as we've come out of them. Um, maybe a bit of a, a hangout or a, a hang up from my university day. So I just want to share some of the definitions I'm using tonight. Um, so ethnicity being a, a state of belonging to a social group that has a common national or cultural tradition and geography being a study of places and the relationship between people and their environment. And here, I also want to specify that for, for the purpose of tonight, I'm mainly looking at the UK. So I want to throw out a bit of a, an icebreaker. And I've, I've put these, these three topics up on screen. So what do these three projects have in common? And um, maybe people can take a minute to, to throw something into the chat. So I'll, I'll give you just a few seconds. And I think I can allow myself to see what's being written. There's some great answers in there. Okay, some interesting ones. So 
you know, do we consider these to be niche? Do we, and, and particularly, you know, on that point of electric vehicle charging, do we think it's niche now? Do we think it's going to be niche in, you know, five, 10 years as we meet some net zero goals, some, some really strong social challenges? Great. There's also, yeah, social economic status playing in. So these are three projects I've worked on and where ethnicity and geography have actually had a, a massive kind of role to play. So for type 2 diabetes, South Asians in the UK are six times more likely to be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes rather than a, than a white counterpart. Um, that has really strong implications on who they know around them living with the condition and can make it a bit more of a challenge to, to change the mentality from it being inevitable to something preventable. For EV drivers, electric vehicle drivers, I don't know if we have any joining tonight, it's obviously very different concerns regarding charging. If you live in a, an urban area where you might have many access to charge points when you're out on the road versus a, a rural area. Also, if anyone's ever tried to make a business model around this, uh, please be aware that public charging is, is free in Scotland, something that I didn't know going into that project. And finally, for domestic abuse support, the availability of local service differs quite widely depending on where you are in the UK. And unfortunately, linguistic barriers are still a challenge for many people in accessing those services. And so these are all things I didn't necessarily know front of mind when I was going into the projects. And I think what it really illustrates is this sentence that I think many of us are, are quite familiar with, which is, you know, we are not our users. And that's exactly why we do research. I think to, to ensure insights are reflecting that population we're serving and, and making sure that we're not excluding anyone, we have to make sure we're speaking to the right people in the right context. And particularly whenever we're doing discovery work, we get to be involved from the very beginning of a, a project and our insights can be that foundation work upon which a product and a service or sometimes you know, many products and services get built. So it's really important for us to create that sort of precedence of inclusivity straight off the bat. I've had other projects on which I've worked where, you know, being inclusive from the get-go has, has brought up some really challenging questions and also, you know, things that we've had to directly change our recommendations for. So, you know, certain instances of how can you ask someone to trust that their complaint against the police is going to be fairly looked into if they've grown up being the target of stop and searches? How do you amend a healthy eating program if our users live in one of the UK's food deserts? And there's, there's some of these where Poor public transportation or the lack of local supermarkets mean they don't easily have access to fresh food. So rather than ask ourselves when we should be including people from different ethnicities and geographies, really we should ask ourselves when would we ever not? And that isn't a rhetorical question. You might be researching a very specific community's experience or creating you know, a hyper-localized service. And I have worked on projects that amount to this, you know, projects for uh, a local council, for example, but what I found is it's really hard to fully understand the challenges and opportunities in silo, particularly if you're, you're only focusing on certain communities within an area, you're unable to realize what some of the inequalities are unless you're comparing it to others. And without realizing that, you can't address it. So my point is that it's on us as researchers to, to sit and think and you know, really consider why are certain people being excluded from that study? And if we can't justify it, then it's on us to realize that there's something we need to change. That being said, I of course want to acknowledge that this isn't always, you know, just a, a matter of willing it to be different. So I'll, I'll share some of the challenges and I'm sure some of these will, will resonate with you all here. Um, it would be interesting to know if there's any others that you guys have faced um, or if there's any of these that maybe, you know, you've, you've been lucky enough to not face. So I, I want to start off with giving a bit of that, that context of working in agency. So I work with teams who are often under a lot of pressure to deliver projects quickly and efficiently. I'm sure that's something that, that everyone here can relate to. But in some contexts, I've worked on multiple projects at once with different clients in different sectors on different timelines. And when you're juggling all those different stakeholders, it can be really challenging to, to stop everything and speak up and make that case for inclusive research. And there's a few factors that play in there. It is complex. Inclusive research isn't, and it shouldn't just be the case of adding a 10 to 20% BAME criteria or asking for that North-South divide, or even specifying that some participants should live in rural areas. 
if you ensure that 20% of your sample are from ethnic minorities, that doesn't cover all ethnic minorities if your sample, and for those of us who, who do qualitative research, if your sample is 15 or even 20, that's not going to cover it. So how do we stay representative? I'm sure many of us have you know, sat around with our, our heads in our hands thinking of everything that we're possibly missing. And in a sprint, that can be really paralyzing, particularly once you think about adding in those intersectional aspects so around age, gender, and income, it starts to feel like a bit of an impossible puzzle. And I've worked on projects where you know, we've tried to cover that North-South divide by having focus groups in, in London and Manchester, and, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly a, a project around sort of family and education. But what that meant was we weren't capturing the differences for rural participants who couldn't make it into the city in the evening. One which I think we all know quite well is being limited in the time we have. Uh, we're often working with teams or other disciplines who required research to have been done yesterday. And in those instances, piling on more criteria can lead to concerns that you're gonna you know, delay recruitment or it might mean you don't find enough people in time. I have been in situations where flagging that recruitment might take a week longer, you know, has meant that the entire plan could potentially be delayed. And in those instances, it's really hard to not starting, you know, kind of having that reel in your mind of all the different things you're gonna to need to compromise on. But here's where attitudes that doing some research is better than nothing get in the way of making sure that you're doing research with the right people. And unfortunately, if you aren't doing it with the right people, a lot of your learnings might not be valid. I've been in situations where I've had no recruitment or travel budget, or I didn't have networks in place to find the right people quickly. Um, I think I've had quite a few instances where I've worked with a, a recruiter to, to get us part of a sample and they've done it brilliantly for the majority of participants. And then they've really struggled to find those last few rural participants. And where it's been really important for the project, I've had to go and, and make that case for additional budget to reach out to a specialist agency. And here, if anyone's ever had that problem, I just want to do a quick shout out to Sarah Morris from Fieldmouse, who does this brilliantly. But when you bring in geography, there's obviously some concerns there around travel time as well as costs if you're doing face-to-face -face research, and, and that can be really difficult to justify. I think that's actually been one of the interesting things about adapting to, to remote work is really how much more open we are now to, to be able to speak to people outside of, of London. I've been instances ever, I've had some instances where clients have requested to, to attend all the interviews, which I think is always great. Um, it's amazing to get clients involved and for them to be able to see kind of firsthand what people's experiences are. But if they really, you know, aren't able themselves to travel, that can really limit who you can bring into your sample. And then finally, I think an important one to address is, you know, sometimes Sometimes researchers, teams, or clients can be too uncomfortable to discuss certain topics. And uh, an example here is, is around asking certain screening questions. I think it's really on us to empower them to ask confidently. And I know this is a really big challenge because I remember when I was starting out, I was screening someone from Northern Ireland and I was so eager to get the ethnicity question over with that I offered up a quick, you know, how would you describe your ethnicity, white, Irish? and received a very icy, no white British. So I'm not from the UK, but I think I definitely knew in that instant that I'd put my foot in my mouth or you know, really done the wrong thing. And that taught me to never rush that question, but really to always ask it open-ended and let the other person answer as they see fit. And I've seen this discomfort with you know, junior researchers starting off as well as more experienced researchers. In certain instances, I work with clients who are able to source some of their customers for us and, and they feel very uncomfortable asking that question. I've also had a lot of clients argue that, you know, really all that matters is, is that person's, you know, financial background or, or their income and which products they're already using. But whenever I've gone into projects doing that, what I found is you end up having really a high risk of ending up with a, a mainly white London-based sample. And what that means is that you're building your product and your service for a mainly white London-based sample. And very often that's not the intention we have. So as we're facing all of these challenges and more, how can we as researchers take action to feel more confident and help those around us? Here's where I wanna share those practical steps and, and tools that I've been using. So I'll share them in the order in which I consider them in a project. Uh, but what I really encourage you as, as you listen is to think, 
you know, are these things that you, you might be able to use in your own workplace or maybe how you would adapt them. So I think it's really important to start off early. Uh, this is a, an integral part of research design rather than something that gets added on later. And I know desk research is something that we all aspire to, you know, have a lot of time to do very thoughtfully and, and yet it can feel incredibly broad and daunting and, and gets brushed aside at times. But doing just 20 to 30 minutes of research, particularly early on as you're going into that research design phase, can really help you understand who you need to be looking out for. And so here I find websites such as the Office of National Statistics, or even just going into Google Scholar and using some keywords for your topic, as well as demographics, can really help you understand, okay, who should I have on my radar? And I think because in this instance, it isn't necessarily good to have that national representative kind of sample as the rule of thumb. It's really important to check the statistics to show if there's any specific population that's disproportionately affected by your topic. So kind of echoing back that example of South Asians and, and type two diabetes. And that's gonna have some implications for your sample as you pull it together and who you need to make sure gets represented. Off the back of your desk research, then you can kind of brainstorm with your team about you know, what are possible certain impacts or who's going to be affected. And that gives you the opportunity to build it into your research plan and make sure that you're going to test that hypothesis with the, the right people. And of course, here's where having a diverse team is crucial. You want to make sure that not only are you able to, to kind of have that open scope as you go in, but that you're not narrowing down on ideas too quickly. And, and we all bring our own biases to our work. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that. I think particularly once you start thinking about criteria, it's interesting to start thinking about what are some of the biggest differences that you might want to explore. So a, a third generation Asian doctor might have more in common with their white colleague than a single black mother juggling different retail jobs. And so when you're pulling that sample together, how do you make sure that you're not only having the former being represented? I know many of us work in, in either tech or in design and, and having the right tools is essential for us getting our work done. And here I find having tools that set a certain standard um, so that it's just a given are incredibly helpful, but also helps you save time. So what we started doing at Design It is developing recruitment spec and screener templates. And so these have all the key criteria from ethnicity, geography, ability, gender, income, and more. And so it's up to the researcher to make the case of what should they be taking off if it's not relevant to the project, as well as adding on that, you know, very project specific stuff around finance, food or energy. And particularly when you're working in agile, or you're in a rush and you have to turn around that spec in you know, a matter of an hour or two, I feel like this has already made a world of difference. Going back to Kind of discomfort within teams. So this isn't something unfortunately that we can do entirely on our own. We do need to make sure that all the key stakeholders are involved. And I feel like here having very short meetings has been the answer, at least in, in how I've dealt with it in teams. So I feel like whenever you have, even if it's just a 30 minute call, if you can fit it into a, a kickoff, that's even better. Uh, it enables you to kind of go over who are you going to be including in the research, this is when you can pull out the assumptions that everyone is making about who they're addressing, but also just point out that actually the criteria that you're including are things that are a given and incredibly important to the project. I think having this conversation not only with your teammates, but also clients and recruiters is essential. I'm a big believer in making sure your recruitment partner is part of the team. They're the ones who are gonna find the people that you're speaking to. So they need to be fully briefed on the project and know exactly why each criteria matters. In instances where I've had some pushback, um, this is really where having done that desk research plays in, where you can bring in the examples and some of those hypotheses that you want to test. So I think I, I've had situations where I've spoken to maybe someone in the, the finance sector who insisted on, you know, maybe we just need to know, you know, how much does someone earn and what products are they using and saying actually cultural differences or even just having family abroad is going to change or at least impact how you manage your finances. And it's gonna not only unveil certain pain points, but also some opportunities. And that's helped the stakeholder understand this is really about not just adding it on as a, a separate initiative, but a core part of how to do their work better. And finally, 
I always find this the, the hardest one to put into words, which is how do we revisit how we, we build rapport with our participants? So we have uncomfortable researchers and, and teams and clients, but also how can we make sure that our participant feels sufficiently comfortable sharing their experience? And I think there are a few things we always do off the bat when we're briefing them, but I think always saying up front that we're not an expert on the topic, particularly if we're, we're dealing with a, a sensitive um, topic, but you have to think that, you know, something like someone's finance, financial situation or how they manage their finances can be very sensitive to them. Uh, so just being very open that we're just there to listen and to learn from them. And I think that's where that, that phrase that a lot of us use around there not being any right or wrong answers plays in. If I'm testing certain concepts that were maybe built with assumptions in mind, I always try to encourage them to challenge it and, and kind of give verbal encouragement when they start doing that so they know that critical feedback is good. I think it's also really important as we're briefing our participants to, to make sure that they get a sense of the power that they have in sharing their experience and how that's going to be able to shape the end product. Something I have seen researchers do is try to find common ground with participants um, to try to put everyone at ease. And here I think it's sometimes counterproductive. I think active listening and mirroring can be much more important, as well as being just aware of positioning in the room. So I think in certain instances where I've, I've dealt with some of the more sensitive topics or, or alighted on something that, that could be sensitive, just taking advantage of having certain stimulus to kind of lay on the ground and, and kneel down and write things in whilst they point from the couch, and, and that really gives the person a sense of control of the situation. So those are just a, a few small things to consider. Um, what I really want to stress is it's not really a mental checklist. There is much more that I think we can all, all do and, and start, you know, trying to explore other challenges that we have and, and solutions to those. But what I think can be helpful as we start considering these is, is to really shift more towards that inclusive mindset. Um, so how can we approach every single part of our work in a way where we really start thinking, you no, know, this could change and, and could give more value. So as I mentioned at the start, um, there's just a, a few key resources that I know that I've learned a lot from. Um, and there's a, I I'll think we'll be sharing the slides after this. So uh, all the hyperlinks should be on there. But some of the initiatives such as uh, the work being done by Project Inklot. I don't know if people are familiar with Leslie Ann Noel's work on positionality, um, but she has a, a lot of really useful resources to share with teams. The work being done by Antoinette Collette out of Creative Reaction Lab. There's a, a great list of resources that have been put together this summer by the AIGA, and as well as some of the, the resources being shared here in the UK. So around, um, I think it's the Design Council did a piece on designing for diversity with two two of the designers from DCA, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the GDS service manual. Um, but that's just a great one to always have bookmarked and, and to kind of go back to as well as to be able to share with teams and clients to say, this is the standard that we should all be aspiring to. So just be before I wrap up, as I said earlier, I'm continuously looking to see how I can improve. Um, I'm in no way perfect in my practice, and I think there's a lot more that, that I can take on. And I also want to be taking on the information to help my teams be more inclusive. So I know we'll have a few minutes for questions, um, but if there's any advice that you'd like to share or anything in particular that you'd like to, to dive into and we don't have the time today, what I'd really encourage you is to reach out on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Um, I'll be kind of looking at them or, or I'm engaging with them more and more. And what I really hope is that this is a conversation that's gonna continue and, and one that we'll see more and more within research spaces. Thanks, Celine. That was really, really uh, interesting and thought provoking. I specifically liked the bit where you showed the examples of different projects from diabetes to um, the car charging thing. And it's really interesting. When we were planning this event, every time I tried to ask for a speaker, every researcher was like, have you tried GDS? Have you tried BBC? Almost feels like we think it is those companies' jobs to have speakers like that or to have inclusive research but I think it's everyone's and and examples I, I like the bit where you also mentioned how it's not when should we consider it but when should we not consider it uh, so yeah thank you so much it just reinforces how I should be better at my research as well and all the challenges that you mentioned are spot on uh, I'll let Anya take over with questions sure I think we have a few very brief one that you probably 
Uh, I don't know if you already mentioned them, Celine, um, or uh, on the last slide, but um, somebody is asking about the field mouse link. Um, and somebody also, like, I think that might, might be connected, Sarah Moorehouse. Do you want to quickly mention that? Uh, so Sarah Morris from Field Mouse. It's just one word. If you look up uh, rural research recruitment, I'm sure that will come up number one. But that, that was an example of a service that came out as, as people, I think, increasingly are aware of the benefits of having diverse samples. And so they've come out and said, this is something that, that we can help and make sure these people get, get their voices heard. Cool. Let's start with um, a question about um, recruitment budget. So you mentioned that um, sometimes you recommend that um, sometimes you don't have, or you said you have no budget. So what mm -hmm. would you recommend? Uh, how can you go about finding people outside of your area or your networks in that case, if you don't have budget? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, and I think that's where social media has, has become an actual boon. So thinking not only, I think here it's having a bit more of an intentional um, approach. So not just thinking, okay, I'm gonna canvas the entire D of the UK. I, I might not have time to do that in a project, but thinking specifically, okay, what are certain areas that have the characteristics that I wanna include in my sample? And then I actually feel like going to local organizations or uh, Facebook buy and sell groups are amazing resources to just speak to everyday people. So joining and, and publishing about your project there is a great way to make sure that you're getting um, people who actually very often don't take part in research and so are kind of that, that golden standard. Brilliant. Um, guys, there's a few questions in the chats as well, but I, I'd urge you to put it over in Q&A if possible because it's very tricky for me to see everything otherwise. Um, so um, Celine, another thing, uh, another question we have um, is from Desi and Desi is asking about um, if you know that an ethnic group is disproportionately affected by an issue related to your research domain, how do you address that in recruitment? So I think that's, um, to, to Shvetha's point earlier, I think very often we go in to, to a sample spec saying we, you know, aim for gender mix, aim for diff different ages, but actually the importance of saying, no, we want a minimum of this amount of people we want a you know a maximum of that amount so that really you're being quite strict with with either your team if you're the ones doing recruitment or with your recruitment partner to make sure that again it's your, those are the amounts that you will need to respect and it's going to be crucial to your to your research um, so i think that's kind of the power of specifying as scary as it can be going into recruitment with that because then that's something that you've yourself committed to um, but the payoff is is definitely there You're on mute, Anya, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you. So um, I'm just wondering, or uh, uh, another person is wondering whether you can maybe share examples of um, tools that, um, yeah, or, or, or tips and tricks, how to, what questions to ask users so to understand if they're experienced in any type of discrimination using a specific product or service. Does that make sense? Is that like a sensitive topic yes. to talk about? Well, um, I think it is a sensitive topic. Um, so is this in the context of a, a screener or in the context of an interview? It seems, uh, I don't know. Open. If the person, it might be open. It's an, yeah. yeah, it seems more open in this case. But if the person, I can't see who this is, it's an anonymous attendee, but if you want to speak up, maybe, uh, yeah, put another question in. I think, um, I mean, I'll, I'll try to answer for both. If if it's relevant to the project, I think um, then, you know, it, it should be in the screener and, and people need to be told, you know, the, the background of the project when they're going into that, those screener questions. Um, so I do think you need to, to let people kind of have that option of taking part or not taking part. I think it's within interviews, um, the student things, either it is a core part of, of the project and it's something that you're already aware that you're trying to test. and then as a team, you can spend, and I've done this for some of the more sensitive topics I worked on, really spending a lot of time, you know, testing those questions with different people, understanding um, how do I, how do I ask this in a way that gives them no indication of, of what I'm expecting. I think it's sometimes 
we, we expect these massive stories when really someone might be uncomfortable. And I think just letting someone within the space of a conversation, and that's where your discussion guide isn't something you should be fully wedded to, but really more flexible with, is being able to actually follow up on some smaller things that they say and kind of ask them, why is it do you think that that, that happens? Um, so I, I think that maybe links back to that last point of trying to make sure that that person feels in, in control of the situation and that you're not asking them to share something uncomfortable if they don't want to. Like, um, what do you do, and this is a question from Lucia, um, to uh, not add your own personal bias in the user selection criteria? I think, I think the first thing is to acknowledge your own bias and, and increasingly be aware of it. Um, and that's where I know very often we, we do work on our own. Uh, if, you know, I sometimes work as a, a researcher in a team with designers. And that's where having those meetings are actually really helpful because you'll have other people challenge with their own bias. But, you know, we're, as an industry, we're not the most diverse um, off the get go. That's something that I know um, we're definitely looking more and more at in design it and trying to think, you know, how can, how can we change this? But that's where not only having the, the different points of views within your own team, but also having that desk research point of view of, you know, there are so many things that we can learn from academia. I know I, I kind of shared some of my mm. frustrations at the start, but there's so much work that has been done that people have been talking about these topics for, you know, 20 years. And we, we unfortunately don't spend much time, you know, and, and here 10 minutes can make the difference of seeing what, what those abstracts are um, on some of the academic journals. And, and that helps you have a realization of, okay, actually, maybe my assumptions are wrong and I need to make sure that this is also gonna be tested. Great, I think um, I'm, I'm summarizing two questions into one for maybe the last question. Um, so this is all about clients. And um, so on the one hand, uh, Trisha is asking, how do you handle a situation where your client wants a mix of demographics, age, gender, but your desk research shows that maybe, um, you know, a specific demographic is uh, disproportionately um, affected? Um, and then on the other hand, so that's prior to the research. And then maybe at the end of the research, what do you do when your stakeholder dismisses the research and says, uh, you know, these are not our users? What do you do? So I think for the, the first one around, so is it about what happens? It's an interesting actually flipping the situation. What happens if you realize that there's a disproportionate amount and you're getting pushback on that? Um, I think here, as I said, having... I actually do advocate you want to have some diversity in your sample. Um, so to that point of being able to compare, I think very often if, if we're just looking at too much of, of the same profile, then we're not gonna fully understand the problem. And that's you know including someone who actually maybe is far more privileged so that we can come out saying, look, these two people have had such different experiences of their, you know, either a, maybe a financial provider or um, of, a, of a local authority assistant. So, I think you might have some pushback on the numbers, but that's where having done the desk research really helps you make that, that claim of like, no, this is in the interest of the project. Um, I know I speak a lot about clients because again, I, I'm coming from agency work and I'm aware there's probably some very different dynamics for, for in-house. Um, if you make sure to have that conversation at the start, so during a, a kickoff or during those my, like meetings with the client, I think that's when they can understand it's integral to the work. It is actually probably their users. And, and here's where I actually really love engaging clients in interviews. It's amazing to, you know, to those points of the ones where they, they just want a certain income bracket and they just want them to use certain products and to bring them on along on an interview with someone who's just not at all actually what you know they were expecting from the assumptions that you heard earlier on, but does meet those basic criteria. I think it's a really big part of research is to expand that client's kind of worldview or, or their mindset around who they're building for. Um, and this is something where I know it, again, tonight's topics kind of interact with so many other things, but um, sometimes I work with, so I've, I've been lucky enough to work with some public sector clients, but also with some very commercial ones who are intentionally trying to be exclusive. And that's the very different challenge where actually, you know, they think, but really, we're not trying to, to please everyone and we're not trying to build for everyone. But in those instances, they're probably not thinking of being exclusive in the sense of 
geography and, and ethnicity. And I think being able to challenge that in conversations of saying, yes, you might only want, you know, a very small part, maybe a very wealthy part of the population, um, but there is diversity in there as well. And actually that's going to bring up some of their own pain points mm. they need to address. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so sorry. I know there's loads more questions, uh, but I think it's time to hand over to uh, Rachel. So um, sorry, we couldn't answer your questions, but do feel free to reach out on Twitter, uh, either directly to Celine or to our Twitter feed. I'm sure Celine will see those and, and can answer the rest. Thank you Thanks so much. You. Hi everyone, thank you Celine. It's really insightful and there's lots of overlaps I think in our in our talk in some ways. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can you let me know when you can see it? Yeah. Right. So yeah, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about quite a big topic, but one quite um, close to my heart um, as a person who's an in-betweener of the East and the West. So um, this is kind of a personal and professional kind of experience um, of insights that I've kind of learned over the years from working in the education space in the last six years of how to really bridge cross-cultural boundaries. So I hope that these insights could just, um, you can experiment and apply them to your work in some way or form. So the first question I wanted to ask was what's your relationship with face masks? Now we've been in the pandemic for nearly a year now and I wonder if that has changed at all and I'm just going to share a quick video with you. Like so many people around the world these days when it's time to leave from home I face it, the mask dilemma. If I wear it, people will panic. But if I don't, it's unsafe. And they'll panic anyway. So, is it better to look dangerous or to actually risk? I choose neither. So what I wanted to illustrate here was that um, this time last year, when we first had the whole pandemic, it wasn't really normal for the West to wear face masks. It's a really a new habit. Whereas in the East, it's in the norm and it's integrated. Um, it was the first point of safety and it was the first item that sold out. Whereas in the West, in the UK in particular, we had new roles, was the kind of crisis. Um, and my friends in the, the East, they just didn't understand why new role was so important. So this is just something to kind of bear in mind that we really need to understand who they are, but beyond the behaviours. So sometimes we look at behaviours and make a lot of judgment in that. And that's something that we can observe but we really need to dive a little bit deeper. So what are the systems are people in? You know, what are the historical patterns that really shape some of the cultures and social norms? So in the East, um, some of my relatives, they've gone through SARS, they've gone through other kind of times in their period where they've adopted and have adapted that they wear the masks. And in Japan, for example, it's a really cool thing um, to wear or even show respect um, for others. 
So it's quite symbolic and it's quite um, a different kind of connotation. And we don't usually take the time to look um, beneath that. And beyond the needs, sometimes we need to look at the cultural values that shapes how those needs are met differently across those different cultures. So at Pearson, um, in the last six years, as I mentioned, um, not just Pearson, but also I lived abroad to work in the education space. I've designed for different ages, from a three-year-old to adult, different cultures. And the other thing we don't usually think about is different level of English, English proficiency levels. So we were designing for people where English is their second language. They want to learn English to move abroad, to have better career prospects and so forth. So how do we really help serve these people in a really global um, market? So the first thing I invite you is to really try to see our own blind spots as a way to cross um, cross-cultural uh, boundaries. And one of the lenses to look at, I guess, um, Celine talked about privilege. Um, and sometimes we're not even aware of it until you're completely out in your own comfort zone or out of your own bubble, say like the London bubble, um, that you would really see the blind spots. And I only saw this when I actually moved abroad to China to experience cultural shock to ask this question like, how weird are we? Because me being born in the West, I would have a certain kind of education. Um, the kind of thinking that I have, you know, would also be that too. In the, in, in the kind of economics wise, it's industrialized, it's kind of rich in some sense, and we have a sense of the democraticness, which certain cultures don't have by default. So it's really recognizing some of those blind spots, but be quite curious with it. The other question to ask is really like, what circle are you in? And who's really in your circle? Because that would tell you how diverse and different perspectives that you bring in or have exposure to in your everyday. Now, I would say that I thought before um, moving abroad, I had quite a diverse network. In London, it's quite ethnically diverse. But actually, I was still in the London bubble, so I didn't really see things outside that. So the way you can do it is to expand outside of it or just step outside um, in some ways. And then you look at your work circle, you know, look at your team. How diverse is it? because that lack of diversity will really determine that level of inclusion within your products, services, and systems that you create, because you're not having all voices, all representatives heard. And so if we don't intentionally include, the risk is really we intentionally exclude by default. So we have to make that an intentional thing and that we take responsibilities as research, researchers and designers. The other thing I found that's really helpful is to really respect other perspectives, really diverse perspectives, the sort of perspectives that makes you feel maybe uncomfortable. Um, and at Pearson, I found that having a triangulation of perspectives is really helpful. So you obviously have the internal part with your stakeholders. And even that, you want to make sure that the, not just the product team, but whoever is part of contributing to that experience should be heard. And some of the times, for example, I've heard again and again, customer service, they are not heard by default. Um, and actually having that voice makes a huge difference. And think about the people who are working um, in that space doing a lot of the kind of tactical things day to day. Usually their voices aren't heard, but they might have some insights to provide. The other one is looking at users, looking at ones that are maybe at the extreme rather than the core ones, because that's not going to give us rich insights anyway. Looking at the ones who might be more vulnerable or the ones that are hard to reach in general. 
And then there's the expert, which is more of the cultural guide expert. So I found this really helpful because sometimes we can't bridge that cultural gap if we just don't know. And having someone to buddy with, whether that's someone, so for example, I had one in the sales team who worked in the Philippines and he was so helpful giving me some cultural context to make sure that the research I was designing is actually appropriate or the methods that I'm using is actually appropriate. Um, so just have that kind of in mind. So here's an example of um, kids having their voice heard in a very different way. Um, a lot of the times our stakeholders, we decide for more of a B2B and only in the last couple of years we've been going to B2C. And the B2B, the one who is decision maker is that we're selling to schools. So the head teachers, the school directors will always have the most prominent voice. Yet we are designing for kids <laughs> and we don't have access to them because they are, people say, well, they're in China, that's really expensive. They're in Turkey, that's really expensive. So what we did, we kind of thought creatively about the recruitment and had members of the team, so like reaching out to certain communities locally to get at least a representative and get them to really co-create. You know, you don't need to always communicate um, fully in words. There are different ways that you can do it. And in this example, we just co-created that, got them to co-create in the form of stories and how they see progress and achievement. We've also moved to online a lot of the times now, um, and we've developed a program, which was a design thinking program for global students around the world and connected them. And we wanted to learn from them as well as um, teaching them design thinking. Now we had a channel for them to share their work. And you can see by them just sharing these um, students, so these students are a little bit older, they're teenagers, so they're allowed to be on Slack but we got them to really um, talk about each other's work. And you can see that level of excitement um, and be able to show and tell all virtually. And we made it work. And this was before the pandemic, actually. We just um, took the learnings that we found that worked well in facilitating and put that into an online space. The other one is to really develop a cultural uh, lens. So what I mean by that, is really immerse yourself in different ways. Now, at the moment we can't travel, but it doesn't mean that you can't immerse yourself in different communities or have exposure of that both online and um, offline. So I think the limits is really your own limits and you can play with that too. In this example, we went to Philippines and India and one of the biggest cultural patterns that I've seen again and again that we don't consider in the West, we um, it's much more of an I individual kind of thing is really prominent in the way we think, act and do make decisions. Now, in the Philippines and India and also in China, um, togetherness is a quite a critical thing in their culture. So think about when we're making decisions, we make big assumptions about who's going to be buying our things and a lot of the time because of the togetherness um, decision makings are usually joint or parents will have a high stake as well so we're thinking about uh, designing for students who are migrating abroad to universities and study and what we found in the Philippines is that it's not the even the um, immediate family it's the wider family of uncles and aunties also getting involved in helping financially to accumulate the amount of funds to support that person going abroad. So it's not a singular decision-making process. And this affects the way we do research. I didn't know that in the Philippines, it's really intimidating to be doing a one-to-one -one research. And actually talking to that cultural expert, it was safer for them to feel that they, they can be open by having a pair of employees together. And so I respected that. And so that's how I did it. And I got richer insights from that. Another one to look at is camera lens, like zooming in and out. 
So you want to sometimes zoom in to look at the real cultural um, local nuances that occurs. But you also want to zoom out to kind of have that bigger picture and go, well, is that a cultural value? Uh, where does that behavior kind of come from? So that, that's a really good lens to kind of again play with and try out. In this example, uh, related to English learning is that people have to take this English test to study and migrate abroad. Now, even though our journey was really focused on the booking experience, we had to look at like, well, what's the bigger motivation? Huh, moving abroad. Okay, what, well, what do you need to do to actually move abroad? Well, you've got a whole university application process. Um, and then you've got to do this English test as part of the visa process. So actually understanding um, the reasons of why it matters to them at certain moments as well, and who's involved in that journey is um, really important to consider. So an example here is that we usually make assumptions that journeys are quite linear. And what we found in one of the insights is that actually um, it's the journey is supported by another person. So, and we didn't take this into account. We thought that the learner will always book the tests. We thought the learner will always prepare themselves and get ready for this test to get the results that they need to get the evidence that they need to apply for the visa. Now, what happened was that in growth markets, merging markets, where you know, their English is not maybe as high or they don't have that level of confidence, they always have an education agent or migration agent that's involved in a journey with them. And we do not serve their needs at all, yet this is a huge gap, an opportunity. Um, and as a result of this research, we built a portal that serves the needs for agents and have a whole partnership program just from this key insight. The other thing to bear in mind between the East and the West is that the West builds trust differently. So in the West is, I give you the benefit of the doubt until it's broken. Um, so trust is really built on a professional competency skill level. So if I said I'm a service designer, you're going to trust me lightly until I break it, <laughs> um, until I show evidence that it's not the case. Whereas in Asia, by default, you have to build that trust. You have to prove that you're worthy of it because they have a low trust cultural system. It's, it's very fragmented and everything. And so trust is really built on relationships. And if you don't have that, you can't build a business. And this is one mistake that I made when I was doing research abroad. Um, this was one of the schools that I didn't attend. I had a local moderator who I thought, well, you know, I can't, I can't speak the language anyway. I've been to so many other schools. There's a couple of schools left, but he can handle it. He's a third party moderator. And that was the issue. That was the thing I didn't realize. So you can see in this banner that it says, Feared welcomes Rachel Leo Pearson to exchange and share. And this was in Beijing. I didn't turn up at that school. The school director lost face and that broke trust. And this was a painful lesson to, to learn because there was a cost involved in the compensation and the complaint. Um, and that just shows how trust is built differently. So my key guiding principles in general uh, for the whole, I guess, my own learnings, is that it's really important to make people feel safe in the first place, because if you can't do that, you're not going to be able to do any form of research. Um, the second part is that you really need to build trust with me, and that is showing a level of vulnerability too from your side in order for that person to also open up. And thirdly, we found that, you know, invite me to join in and and play, co-create, um, just like when we had this lab space. So, and this was designed intentionally where it can be quite inclusive, where we can change it and, um, you know, have cushions. We, we, we asked our manager to buy these cushions um, as a way to express how, they, how participants might feel. Um, but this works just as well for stakeholders as well as like for kids. 
So having this in mind was something that, um, yeah, it's, it's important and we can do the same thing in a virtual space too. So really my last point is, um, culture is really always evolving and changing and it really involves a growth mindset of that continuous learning and unlearning and relearning. Um, and that's what's really helped me to kind of postpone that judgment of that behavior and really question my assumptions and to continuously observe and listen to what really matters because it's much more deeper than what you can see. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm open for any questions. Thanks, Rachel. That was Thank very, you. very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask a quick question, actually? Um, sure. And, and I think Anya has some questions as well. So I, I found that really interesting, given that I, you know, go back to India and, and I sometimes I'm not sure if I'm properly Indian anymore. I'm kind of in between. Um, but yeah, I was curious, like if you're doing research in different cultural contexts and you've made that realization that you need to kind of immerse yourself and learn different cultures if you're designing for them, how do you make sure you're not judging those different cultures, especially if you don't belong to that culture? Yeah, I think that's why that cultural expert and partnering up with someone is super important and hear their story first or hear something about them. Yeah, and I think a joined up, everyone can relate to food. And I feel like food in our team was the thing that just gives the space to talk about sharing that kind of culture anyways and then you break that ice and then you get to talk about different topics so anything related to food online offline I realized that has always worked consistently um yeah during even the pandemic period which yeah for for people who are new to the team as well because the way that we hire we make sure that there are quite a different spectrum of cultures and that has made it much easier actually. So I would go, oh, not sure what's happening there. Maybe I'll talk to someone from that Turkish background and just have a chat with her just to understand and be curious. I think once you put the hat on of curiosity, that would delay that judgment. That makes a lot of sense. And given that I work for a food delivering company, I like the idea of warming up with food. Um, Anya, over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to like uh, share a sentiment that actually uh, Sandra shared in the chat that I fully agreed with. She said, wow, thank you for sharing that vulnerable experience and lessons learned. Really, really appreciate that. So, so thank you so much for showing that um, you made a mistake and hey ho. Um, so that that was really super super good to to see. So thank you. That was probably just a comment. Um, but then um, I've got a few like quite a lot of questions actually. So let me see. Um, so I'm taking one from chat just because I'm here. Um, so do you have any tips and resources for finding cultural experts when planning to do research in another culture? Um, so any any consideration when you especially when you do this um, I guess virtually. I actually think it's quite informal than what you think. Um, so even within the different communities, we have access to a lot of those. We just don't expose ourselves to that. So I remember doing a social innovation project and that was in Kingston. So you could say it's quite local and our brief was to, I know, to look at elderly growing up. Um, what do they kind of need? And I wanted to look at like Asian cultures. Well, what does that mean to have a healthy kind of living? And I found lots of charities and talking groups and things like that. You kind of be surprised about the amount of free resources available where people actually might want to have their voices heard too. Um, so, and joining to some of those communities is kind of very helpful. And I wouldn't say it needs to be formal at all. I would just say like everyone has their own kind of cultural expertise um that you can kind of leverage really and I think it's the yeah it, it's kind of like if you enjoy traveling and exploring new places 
you will get that sense of wonder that what you can be doing in online and offline spaces too and meetups and things. Great, thank you. Before I go to the next question, would you mind sharing your screen again? Because uh, people are asking for your, the QR code. It was just like popped up and then you unshared it. So people didn't really see it. Would you mind sharing that again, that last slide? Sure, so the QR code is that I'm, I'm basically, I basically founded a um, inclusive pioneers com uh, community last year during the pandemic to really kind of help people to understand and grow their cultural intelligence, but in a more kind of informal gathering, com meaningful conversation sort of way that I facilitate every now and again. So that's just to have access to that really and find out more. Yeah, do, do you mind sharing that again? So literally put it on the screen. Yeah. Um, so that people can have a look. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Um, so I think you answered that a little bit already, but maybe you can go deeper. We have a question about uh, participants in China and the, um, the person asking this question said that they felt that participants in China were super shy and scared. Uh, and how did you break through to get them to talk? And, and the person who mentioned this question said they're part Asian, so it, they found them super shy. So do you have any more tips? Uh, on that piece. Yeah, I think they're super shy because first of all, that fear of authority is quite a big one and that level of hierarchy. Um, they already probably see you as more senior. <laughs> and as a result of that, they don't, unless you're at a similar level, they're not gonna openly share that because they wouldn't be doing that in a work context. So understanding that there is this whole hierarchy across cultures of this power dynamic and being really cautious of that. And I found that sometimes doing, giving them a pre-work activity because then they don't feel that they're being judged either. Where that kind of homework pre-task to get them to actually uh, write out, draw out, you know, a journey, a timeline or something like that. Um, and then have the conversation to talk about that because then you have a point of reference and it's not really aiming <laughs> at them also too. Um, so that's that's kind of one way that I found really helpful. Another thing is that they, they actually look at you yourself and will make a judgment on that. So I realized in the, when I went to the Philippines, because I was Asian, actually they already softened a bit more and unfortunately, that does happen. So um, again, because of that kind of level of authoritativeness that's there by default. Um, so yeah, kind of being that less informal kind of, yeah, more informal kind of way is a, is a better way to do it. And actually, one tip that is related to food, <laughs> The, one of the school directors actually asked me to, to have um, food first before doing the interview. And you can see that was part of the relationship building. <laughs> so it's really finding a way to build that relationship first. And how I recruit users, weirdly, I've used the, the way of building trust, which is relationship first. So I found someone who knows someone and that connectiveness mates puts them at ease too um, and I've been fortunate because I've lived in Shanghai coming back to UK was easy because I have a network of people who I can talk to so I have a little bit of a, an advantage there. Sounds great the only thing that I would be afraid of if you like schedule your your sessions and your times like tightly and then all of a sudden you have to eat first and then you're on a tight <laughs> schedule I mean I don't know if that happened but probably um I don't know I would probably schedule times a bit more flexible but I don't know if you you had that issue yeah no you you need to they expect maybe part of it that blur between work and personal you're probably going to be doing some of that getting to know you outside of work hours and that's almost a slight expectation um and having a local moderator, I find as well, is, is probably going to be more helpful to you. 
So maybe, and, and it will be intimidating for them to have other stakeholders. And that's just something again to, to bear in mind, you know, the less people is probably going to be um, better. Um, so we have uh, Suki who's asking about co-creation. Um, and they are wondering how co-creation can be enabled with remote online research. Do you have any any tips in particular in terms of tools which which made it easier for you? Yeah, we've been experimenting that or we had to actually. So last year we used, or we're still using, um, Miro has our key co-creation way of doing that with India and Turkey last year. Mm -hmm. I would say they were really they were really enthusiastic talking to people because they were in lockdown just like we were so interestingly it was a really good way for them to practice their English and they absolutely loved it and I've never seen that they shared more because of it so interestingly in certain cultures they will share a bit more in online spaces more than face to face so that's another thing to be aware of um, you have to experiment to try it and I think don't be worried to make that mistake either because all these insights is from my mistakes that I'm, I'm kind of sharing with you now <laughs> so um I have yeah, definitely yeah. made them to to share with you so that you can yeah just more have a have something in mind but Miro works really really well because it's quite slick and use that with Zoom um, so you kind of screen share and work with that. For them to participate though, so last week we had one where participants actually co-create being hands on the board. It is quite fiddly and it might take a little bit longer to warm up, but because it's much more, you can make it so much more vibrant and colorful and a playground like, then it's just like likely that they would join in. So having things like an option to write on the chat box as she's as you guys are doing now, is another alternative. So having those alternative channels, because everyone will have a slight difference in how they would want their voices heard. That makes sense. I'm going to ask you, I guess, one last question. Um, and this time, like the other side of the, the participants, so your state about your stakeholders. How are you raising awareness about cultural differences, like, you know, with, with your stakeholders? How would you go about educating them um, about this topic? That's a question from Celine. Yeah, so all of the projects that we've been on, we get them involved in that process. And I think that's super important. Um, we are almost co-partners with them along in that journey. So they get to actually see like, well, why are we recruiting this sample? And I was like, well, if you want to grow into that market, you haven't heard any insights from that. And these are your riskiest assumptions. Are you willing to take those risks before going to market? You know, and I think reframing it as risk first from a business context is really helpful. So that's to get the buying for the recruitment part, because at first, I didn't have funding to, to do the research to do with agents and then go to um, Philippines and uh, India by default. It was raised as a case going, oh, we are underserving this market. So there was informal uh, conversations that were had from the learner's perspective. That became a business case. And that became a, what's the cost of not doing it. <laughs> I, I think that's really helpful to have. And then as you said, to raise, to raise the awareness, then you use the power of storytelling of how you share your insights and making sure you have certain video clips along in the journey to make it really powerful and stand out, that it's not me talking about what I've heard, it's what you hear and see based on, you know, the kind of real evidence. I think you're on mute. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, there's some uh, more questions that came in, so let's see if we, you guys still have a bit more time let's see uh, we have one from Andrea uh, who says what about the digital inclusion scale and levels of digital literacy particularly those at the lower ends of digital literacy scales any tips on reaching out to these groups across cultures 
to uncover drivers that would encourage to take up uh, products or services. Well, that was quite long. That, Sorry, yeah, that, that, one's, that one's a harder one because I would have to say our challenge is reaching uh, kids during the pandemic where parents are full on, hands on, schools are manic, <laughs> um, to really do research with kids. And I would say it's the disadvantaged kids that will, um, yeah, will find it most tricky. So I've been a coach where I get to coach disadvantaged kids, but that has been really hard for them to show up. So we haven't been that successful from a research perspective because I see the context in that and I can give you that as the main example. But I would say have the, your local partners too. So if you're going to different markets, have those local partners that could be on the ground, that could be listening, that could be, you know, in some of those um, places that unexpected places and communities where it's more face-to-face -face led, they, they can be part of that because we won't be able to, due to language barriers, we won't be able to um, even have access to that ourselves. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to quickly answer a question that we got a bit earlier from Pete. Um, so uh, it's very tricky for like, I'm, I, I would be happy to share all the questions that the um, two panelists got uh, that we had to dismiss, uh, but it's really tricky to, to do that uh, with you. So I realize you can't see our dismissed questions. So apologies for that. It's something that we can work on for next time so that you'll see the questions um, longer so hopefully hopefully that helps but get in touch Pete if you have any a particular question or need. Um, great, um, thank you Rachel, thank you Celine, I'm handing over to Sweta. Thank you Will. thanks Rachel, that was really really insightful and thank you Celine as well. I think there have been some amazing takeaways overall, I think um, for me the main takeaways that I would like to leave you guys with is this is not a job that is done. We need to continue having this chat. And I think thanks to Celine and Rachel, we have lots of really different perspectives that are overlapping. We need to think about cultures. We need to think about projects. I really like the idea of focusing on doing some desk research, even if it's a little bit of time and, and stakeholder engagement and, and you know understanding our blind spots and stuff. I love that acronym, Rachel, the weird <laughs> acronym. Uh, I'm going to try and remember that one. Uh, but yeah, overall, um, I hope you found this really helpful. And I hope we don't um, forget about this topic because it's not one person's responsibility. And uh, yeah, every time we get a project, we need to challenge ourselves to do even better because that's how we reach even better awesomeness for our research. Uh, and with that, I'm going to just thank everyone Thank you, Anya. Thanks, Rick, for amazing tweeting. And uh, thanks again to Zebra people. And uh, Michaela is probably going to tweet her sketch note soon. So do look out for that. Um, I think that's it. What do you want to say? Any final thoughts, anyone? YouTube, uh, we will, like on Twitter, we will post the link to uh, the recorded version of this um, at some point. So. Um, just follow follow us on Twitter and, and you'll see when. Um, and obviously there will be more events coming up. Um, so follow Twitter as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, big thank you to Swetha who uh, for at least a couple of months will go on a little break um, for her maternity leave. So 